Dear learners, greetings from IIT Guwahati. We are in the MOOCs course Power Plant System Engineering Module 4 that is Hydro and Renewable Energy Power Generation Systems. In today's lecture, we will focus on another category of renewable energy that is geothermal energy. So, we will touch upon topics like origin of geothermal energy, different types of geothermal energy systems and uh, whatever uh, most possible and uh, effective way of uh, harnessing this geothermal energy are of two types and they are mainly on hydrothermal systems and we call them as vapor dominated systems and liquid dominated systems. So, they are typically hydrothermal systems and we will try to see why we say hydro because it is mostly the working fluid is water so that is the reason we say it is a hydro. But however, this water is not in its purest form, it is highly saline at the same time there are many gaseous components which are already present in this water. So, that water content we call this as a brine. So, I will talk about those aspects in this lecture. Now, let us understand that uh, where we are in if you look at power generation systems through fossil fuel energy as a reference. So, in this fossil fuel based power generation systems that is mostly steam power systems our main focus was that energy that comes into this systems through boiler or steam generator is fossil fuel combustions or coal based combustions in presence of air. But to depletion of fossil fuels we switch upon to other sources of renewable form of energy they are geothermal, solar, nuclear they are possible ways. Until this point of time we have covered this passive form of uh, solar energies which is available in nature that is called wind energy, then ocean temperature energy conversion OTC plants, then we have hydroelectric energy that comes by virtue of solar heating and that which is available in the form of rains creating a dam, we can store the energy of water and that energy is the potential form of energy and through this process we uh, convert them to kinetic energy and subsequent rotating the turbines we get harness the power. Then we have this tidal energy which is mainly by virtue of uh, the gravitational effects of lunar and uh, solar cycles on the ocean surface. So, basically all these forms of uh, energy which we have discussed so far they are renewable form because they all of them come from the solar energy and effect of solar energy on this surface itself. So, we will talk about the solar energy much later, but uh, now let us dig into the fact that if at all uh, whatever form of energy which are available on the surface that is termed as renewable energy, but there are other possible ways that we can uh, energy is also available in the earth's crust and those are also renewable form of energy and they comes under the category of geothermal energy. So, basically geothermal energy is also a kind of renewable energy, uh, but it is available not on the surface or in the higher atmosphere, but it is underground. So, it is available in the earth's crust. So, uh, we know that earth formation of earth has started in millions years of ago and uh, if you take this inside crust of earth there are all the materials uh, which is mainly because earth crust is mainly made out of carbon materials and uh, they are uh, available in plenty within the earth's crust. So, if you dig into the earth we will find many sources of energy 
the energy resources which are available in plenty and they are nothing but your heat source. But if you can tap those heat source, then we can get a substantial amount of energy which is capable for running a power plant systems. So, what we can say that geothermal energy is a kind of a natural energy resources and they were available since the formation of earth, but till this point of time our main attention was mainly high energy density contents and those are in the form of fossil fuels. So, essentially all the fossil fuels are derived from the earth's crust like all the petroleum products they are derived from the earth's crust and till this point of time there was no scarcity, but since there is a scarcity of these fossil fuels because rate at which energy demands are coming the fossil fuels are not no longer is supposed to supply this because although nature makes its own fossil fuel through its ecological processes, but what happens the rate of demand is much much higher. So, it cannot supply. So, uh, human attention is now more focused to other sources of natural energy which is again available in the earth crust, but they may be in a lesser energy contents and those energy contents uh, are still unattended because with our available technology so far we are not able to reach those energy resources. But now time has come that since the fossil fuels are depleting we should also dig into those low energy contents which is available in the earth's crust. But what happens is that uh, those are predominantly available in some localized pockets under the earth surface. So, basically uh, uh, these low energy contents they are not available in every places on the um, earth they are available in specific locations on the earth surface. So, essentially geothermal energy if you look at they are available at some locations where we used to see volcanoes, we used to see um, lavas. So, that means energy from earth's crust tries to come up in the form of fire or high density gas that comes out from the earth's crust through some passage or vents. So, if you can tap those kind of things energies then it becomes a better usage of our natural resources in the form of renewable energy. So, now let us see that what is this geothermal energy let us try to understand the origin of uh, geothermal energy. So, what we can claim like this is that geothermal energy is the uh, energy resources which is available in the form of heat and this heat has to be transported from the interior earth through uh, steam or hot water. That means, if this we can tap this in the form of hot water or steam then we can harness this. So, it is also in the form of renewable, but they are not available in plenty uh, at every location of earth interior but they are geographically they are available at some specific locations. But unfortunately with our available technology we have still not uh, available conventional technology we are not been able to extract that energy. But uh, this natural heat energy how do you say that that location is a geothermal site we will find those locations there which are more prone for volcanoes, lava flows, hot springs geysers they are like some hot spray of water that comes out from the underground so, that is a location which can be treated as a geothermal energy resources. So, uh, just to give some history of this uh, resources because earth is said to have been created by a mass of liquids and gases out of which 5 to 10 percent are the steam. So, when this fluid is cooled down by losing uh, heat on the surface that means, uh, these steams when they try to come out of the surface and they form uh, when they try to cool down a losing heat surface the outer solid crust is formed with an average thickness of 32 kilometers. So, I will these are the numbers realistic numbers 
that has been taken from the book and so what happens inside there are some uh, solid crust they when those energy they find some passage to come out they come through certain vents or some passages and through that passage when they come out they try to cool down when they cool down they come as a condenses as water and what water we see in the sea or oceans they are nothing but that comes from the earth's crust and that is what it is claimed now if you actually do into the earth crust we have molten mass that is called magma and these are still till now also these magmas are in the process of cooling and so when they cool on the earth surface they forms seas or lakes and oceans and another point that i would like to mention is that the historical background tells that many earth tremors that means whenever there is some kind of a earthquake so we will find some kind of disturbances uh, in the different layers of earth surface so due to this this disturbances in layer there are some passage or cracks which starts developing inside this earth crust and those are the kind of the passages that gets initiated for this formation of this volcanoes or lavas now uh, through this process what happens whatever materials that are stored inside the earth they try to come out uh, so initially it starts with this magma so when the magma tries to come out through this so we'll have steam we have brines and when they come out they come out by mixing with different parts of earth crust so thereby many gases also are diffused within that component and we entire things we call this as a brine so essentially when you dig into our surface if you go much much deeper whatever liquid material that we are going to extract that will be called as a brine because it's a mixture of so many water plus so many other gas components so that is the main reality of this geothermal systems now with geothermal point of view these uh, cracks or vents are called as fissures so that is nothing but these are the passages through which the inside materials of earth tries to come out now let now let us see the more pictorial representation uh, of a typical geothermal field so we'll try to see that what is the geothermal resources which are available so essentially speaking this picture shows that one particular geothermal field at a given geographical locations now in a geothermal field and there are different zones so they are mentioned as a b c d e f g and h so what we see here is a much below this earth crust so we are going deep into this earth crust so we say it's a underground now if you go much deeper we will find a regions where we will find the zone a so zone a is known as hot magma zone so this hot magma zone is the main resources which where these things are available as a molten materials so they are like some kind of boiling materials which starts boiling inside the crust but they tries to come out but they are unable to come because there are so many different layers through which it tries to come so when they tries to come this molten mass tries to radiate or diffuse heat so they try to make the nearby vicinity area they try to make from either they solidify them or entire earth crust which is available in the rock form they try to heat them other way is that if there are some water which is deep inside the earth crust they try to become hot and hot so when so they form a steam which which tries to come out from the earth crust so through this there has to be some passage that this steam has to come out but since there is no passage but over the years there are different cracks are developed due to the earthquake or any other geographical uh, accident through this process we have there are vents or cracks that are developed through which 
this material tries to come out. So, basically we have one region which is called as uh, magma, second region is called as ignition rock because these are like volume of crust which are available. So, we call this as a igneous rock which is nothing but your hot rock. Then third category is in the region C. So, region C is a it is a like a reservoir permeable reservoir. So, basically it is a permeable water reservoir. So, whatever water that comes when they come out uh, from this earth crust they try to store in this particular belt which we call as a permeable reservoir. But this permeable reservoir is also capped in another area and that is called as solid rock. So, basically B is called as igneous rock that is a fire rock and D is nothing but heat rock or a solid rock that is also hot. And now all these earth materials when they try to come out, they either come out in the form of, uh, so E is nothing but your we can say it is a passage or vents and in geothermal category we call as fisheries. So, they are nothing but the passages. Now, through these passages when the inside earth material they try to come, we land off having seeing in the net effect as hot springs or hot well and uh, also uh, we have uh, hot well, hot spring and also in the form of geysers, geyser means it is a supply of hot water. So, so, all these things we see in the earth surface. So, essentially these are the uh, areas we see the effect of underground earth crust on the surface. But however, uh, if you look at actually this geothermal systems, we can categorize the type of heat which they contain in two ways. One is called as magnetic steam which originates from the magma, other is meteoritic steam which originates from the ground water heated by magma. So, magma some materials that comes directly through some passes. So, it is like a hot spring or uh, we can say it is a directly it can come. Other things earth crust that comes through this fisheries passages. So, there are two ways either to harness this geothermal energy. So, what you do from the earth surface you go underground try to reach hot rock or this fire rock and put your fluid from the outside or from the ground and then try to heat up that fluid. That means, to go into this we need to go towards maybe 32 kilometer deep to arrive at this zone B. That is one way. Other way is that in case you do not go deep into this regions, let us say this deep is around 32 kilometer. If you are unable to go that, then what we are in the regions, let us say in the region D, where we can have impermeable hot rock or in the region C, we can reach in the form of permeable porous permeable reservoir, where we can extract these fluids, because they are actually reservoir heat source which are available and we can extract these fluids to the ground and again re-inject. So, that is what essentially the entire geothermal system does. So, through this process we classify different types of geothermal resources. One is hydrothermal systems, second geo pressurized systems, third is petrothermal systems. So, in the geothermal systems we mainly target either uh, target the liquid regions. So, either it can be liquid uh, we can tap the, the fluid which is inside the earth crust either in the uh, they are completely high temperature liquids or they can be high temperature vapors. So, of course, pressure is much much higher. So, they are stored in that regions. So, that is what uh, we call this as a hydrothermal systems. That means, we are extracting the fluid from the earth crust. 
Other category of systems is geopressurized systems in which we tap water from the underground aquifer. So, basically we are going to that water reservoir that is zone C which was shown in that things. So, there we have this permeable rock, gravels, sand. So, when you go close to 2.5 kilometer to 9 kilometer depth, we uh, reach this particular point. So, where the energies are available in pressurized form uh, with a what we say in a through rock, gravels or sand. So, we tap we plan to tap them. So, geo pressure is thought to be a temperature of 160 degree centigrade, pressure can be 1000 bar, 1000 bar is too high. So, that but with high salinity, high salinity means it is a very saline water and of course, it is saturated with natural gas which is mainly methane and often we call this water as brine because it is not in its purest form it is in the form uh, water is there and that water can be either liquid dominated or vapor dominated and in which they are diffused with natural gas. So, considering all of them we say it is a, we call this as a brine. Then third category is the petrothermal systems they make use of hot dry rock for which the temperature is available in the range of 150 to 300 degree centigrade with close proximity and of course, these contribute 85 percent of geothermal resource of any type. And these rocks are also available in moderate depth, but they are highly impermeable. So, in order to extract this energy, we require a carrier fluid which has to be injected or pumped into the ground. So, basically petrothermal systems uses outside fluid which is pumped into those rock regions and try to harness the energy. And uh, hydrothermal systems is the other side of story where we do not um, re-inject any fluid outside rather we take out the inside fluid to the ground make use of it and then re-inject it. So, in our discussions we will mostly focus on the hydrothermal systems that makes some similarity with our steam power plant in which we have discussed about the thermodynamic cycles that can be useful for this course. So, in our discussions we will try to focus on only on hydrothermal systems they are of two types one is vapor dominated geothermal systems other is liquid dominated geothermal systems. So, first we will discuss about this vapor dominated geothermal systems. So, you refer to this thermodynamic circuits what the circuit represents here is a vapor dominated hydrothermal systems. We can say we have digged a well, well is nothing but we can dig a well on the uh, earth surface keep entering into the earth crust and through this dig well we extract the fluid and this fluid is nothing but typically we have this brine. And when you take out this fluid and there is a valve which is there is a throttle valve which of course, regulates the pressure and of course, you have the centrifugal separator. So, in the centrifugal separator what does this do is that it takes all unwanted products all, all unwanted uh, corrosive products from this brine and whatever it goes to the turbine ideally vapor has to expand in the turbine. So, ideally it goes whatever purest form which is available as a water. So, we say whatever goes into the turbine is nothing but water vapor and rest of the things are gets discharged outside and rest of the things are similar to a Rankine cycle where after turbines expansion it goes to the condenser through this condenser that is a heat rejection systems. So, heat rejection system means that is we have a cooling tower that supplies the feed water systems to this condenser. Uh, so, it so since it is also water and this is also vapor. So, we can have a direct contact type condenser then condensate pump and whatever left out things that means uh, whatever left out water 
they again re-injected through this well. So, this is the so through well we extract, purify, use it and then we dump into the well again. So, this is how this thermal circuit works. Now, if you understand this diagram in a if you represent this in a temperature entropy diagrams, now with a relative comparison we say we do not have a boiler or steam generator as we see in a Rankine cycle. So, we start with a locations where already steam is available to us. So, uh, that means we are available at some particular point that is state point 1, but at state point 1 we cannot directly expand in the turbines. So, it has to go through the state 3. So, state 3 means through some separation process only vapor comes to the turbines. So, it tries to expand. So, when it expands we have this isentropic process 3, 4 s. If it is a non isentropic we it follows 3, 4. The next of the things is condensation process that is from 4 to 5. So, there is of course, there is no pump work, but even though there is a condensed pump, but the pump work is very negligible as compared to the, this thing that is normally happens. And again the supply for the condenser or feed water system is achieved through 0.7. So, that is nothing but the 0.7 is the cooling tower exit and that supply necessary water to this cooling medium. So, this is about the operations. So, we will try to put some numbers because those numbers your working fluid is available. So, one thing is that water in vaporized form into steam it reaches to the surface almost as close to up uh, many these are the temperature which availability of temperature that is we have 205 degree centigrade and 8 bar pressures. And if you can tap those kind of working fluid then only that will be suitable for turbo electric power plants. So, here uh, these processes have already explained like the water that comes in a saturated conditions they are at 35 bar and 200 degree centigrade. There is a drop in pressure through this drop in process and that 1 2 process is throttling. Again this drop in process gives slightly superheat conditions. So, we reach so initially when it comes at higher pressure, but at saturated conditions, but when actually enters into the turbine pressure drops as there is a drop in pressure, but we reach in a superheated conditions and that we expand in the turbine. So, this is what we achieve for a vapor dominated systems. So, other part of things that is more important that we the mass flow rate reinjections uh, is of course, less than the originating well because there are losses in the centrifugal system, steam jet rejector, evaporation, drift and blow down. So, whatever mass of water that is available in the form of brine, so the content of water gets reduced when it is re-injected. Of course, that is quite obvious. Now, there are another category of geothermal systems in which the system is liquid dominated. So, liquid dominated like if you uh, refer our previous figure we started the expansion in the turbine when the water availability or brine availability is already in the saturated vapor. So, this is nothing but saturated vapor and this side we have saturated liquid line. So, here in a vapor dominated systems the availability of your working fluid is already in the saturated vapor line. But if you look at the liquid dominated systems, the availability of working fluid is not at saturated vapor line, rather it is close to saturated liquid line. So, that is the essential difference in a liquid dominated systems and vapor dominated systems. So, then what happens? Then uh, we have to use, uh, there are two types of methods that we use. Either we use the same working fluid and make it vapor and then use in the turbine. Other way is that instead of taking this that as working fluid which is not at all suitable for expansion, we normally use a binary systems or binary cycle systems. So, in a binary cycle systems what we normally do is that we use the underground energy available in the brine as a heat source and that heat source is being used to vaporize our secondary working fluid. Since we have using a secondary working fluid that cycle we call it as a 
binary cycles. So, normally what is the main demerit in the liquid dominated systems? Because when water comes from underground in the form of brine, there are various degrees of salinity and they range from 3000 to 280000 ppm dissolved solids. So, separation is a big task. So, that is the reason we a separator system what we call as flask separator is normally used. So, we call this as a flask based systems. But the advantage we have is that when you look at liquid dominated systems, the underground temperatures which are available to us is closely in the range of uh, 175 to 315 degrees centigrade and of course, they are at high pressure and we take them for our use. Now, let us try to understand something basic difference what we get in a flash steam systems and it is a liquid dominated. So, we see that from the underground reservoir we get this brine and this brine enters into the flash separator and this is the most critical part for a liquid dominated systems because brine contains high salinity water. So, what we require? Uh, now, in a single flash systems, we need same working fluid is be, will be used in our thermodynamic cycle which is supposed to be fed to the turbine. So, for that reasons whatever water or brine is available which is in the saturated liquid form that is state 1 and through this when you take out this brine there is a drop in pressure. So, first pressure drop takes place from 1 to 2. Now, from 2 to 3 there is a flash separator. So, basically we that separator does uh, the water part uh, whatever vapor contents in this brine they take it out and liquid part that sends it back. So, that is the job of this flash separator. So, at point 3 which is somewhere in the region liquid vapor region. So, this is saturated liquid, this is saturated vapor and this is liquid vapor regions. So, initially we have this brine that comes. So, and this side we say only water vapor. So, that means after this separations water vapor we take out and it goes to state 4 that is the inlet condition for the turbine where it expands to 0.6 then it goes to condenser. And here also since working fluid is same we can use the direct contact type of condensers and rest of the cycle is simple. And whatever at again at point 3 we say what is this unused brine that comes out again re-injected into the well. So, this is how single flashed steam based systems and it is a liquid dominated geothermal system. Now, in a binary cycle what we do? So, we have the same brine, but we do not use the same brine in the working fluid. And if you look at there are two parts, one is the brine that comes from the underground reservoir and through this appropriate throttling it enters to a heat exchanger. So, through this heat exchanger the brine releases heat to the secondary fluid. So, this secondary fluid constitutes and this secondary fluid constitutes the working fluid for our thermal cycles. So, those working fluids are organic fluids and they are mainly isobutane and they are mainly low boiling point fluids typically isobutane, freon for which uh, their, their boiling point is minus 10 degree centigrade and for friend 12 it is minus 29.8 degree centigrade and through these fluids we can operate them at relatively high pressure corresponding to source water and heat sink temperatures. So, a liquid dominated systems use a secondary fluid and we call this as a binary cycle. Other parts are uh, almost uh, similar because it also follows the conventional Rankine cycle for this power generation systems. So, this is all about the lect lecture contents that I am supposed to discuss. 
Now, based on our discussions, we will try to solve some numerical problems. So, this numerical problems uh, what we have is something similar to what we solved in a Rankine cycle systems, where we have superheated steam, saturated steam, but only difference between them is that we try to bypass uh, at least what happens in the boiler or steam generators. So, basically speaking, we have already available steam which is available either in the saturated liquid line or saturated vapor line. So, your primary we have to use the same steam tables or temperature entropy diagrams for water systems. So, the first problem let us try to understand that it is a vapor dominated geothermal systems and with is a capacity of 100 megawatt. Saturated steam is extracted from the oil with a sort of pressure at 30 bar. Since it is a saturated steam, obviously the state point 1 in this thermal circuit lies on the saturated vapor line and this is liquid plus vapor. If you refer this TH diagrams, so it is a critical point this side is saturated vapor line, this line is saturated liquid line and even in between it is liquid plus vapor line. So, we locate the point that point 1 is at 30 bar, steam enters the turbine at 7 bar and condenses up to 0 0.2 bar, but steam enters the turbine at uh, 7 bar. So, 0 0.3 that is at 7 bar, but this pressure is available at let us say 30 bar. So, 1, 2, 2 and further 3 it is a throttling process that is already defined in which enthalpy remains same and from 3 to 4, 4 s is a expansion in turbines. So, we have given with an isentropic efficiency of 0.8 then we have this combined efficiency of turbine generator that is 0.9 that means turbine plus generator they have this combined efficiency of 0.9. So, essentially effectively it is whatever power developed by the turbine 90 percent of them is converted to electricity. Then other information that is available if for this side that is feed water systems or cooling through this cooling tower. So, we have this cooling tower conditions which is at 22 degree centigrade and re-injection occurs prior to cooling tower. Okay. So, this is the problem and whatever we have asked, we are essentially asked to find the steam flow rate in the turbine, cooling water flow rate in the condenser, then heat rate and efficiency of the systems. Heat rate means how much heat we can, we are actually tapping from this brine. So, let us try to understand the problem for this problem you have to refer steam table so again we have to relook into the steam table with the given data available to us so first thing let's say what is state 1 so state 1 is at p1 that is 30 bar and that point 1 is saturated. So, at these conditions saturated pressure table can be referred and we can write H 1 is equal to that is enthalpy is nothing but saturated vapor region that is at 30 bar. So, from this steam table this number is 2804.2 kilo joule per kg. Then we have state 3, state 3 means inlet to turbine and we in between of course, we have this throttle valve, but again there is initial drop in pressure and maybe we can directly say from 1 to 3 is as we can refer it as constant enthalpy process. So, when you say constant enthalpy process, so we can use this H 1 data to calculate the enthalpy at state 3 
and enthalpy at state 3 is nothing but slightly superheated region. So, you can note down here and H 3 and that is at is equal to 2804.2 kilo joule per kg. So, we have two data here and point 3 is like P 3 at that point it is pressure is 7 bar. So, there are two data pressure and enthalpy. So, this will give you this saturated temperature T 3 as 180 degree centigrade. To, to have this number we have to refer superheated table for which two data is required H 3 and P 3 and we get T 3 is this. Okay. And for this pressure, if you take saturated temperature at 7 bar, so this number is 165 degree centigrade. So, we can say degree of superheat that means this drop in pressure gives rise to a degree of superheat is about 15 degree centigrade that is difference between these two. Now, we are already in the state 3 then we will look into the expansion process in the turbine. Then we have to see uh, for state 4 and 4 s. So, process is isentropic and but that where P 4 s and P 4 that pressure is 0.2 bar right and process is isentropic which means S 3 is equal to S 4 S and S 4 S is nothing but S F plus X 4 S into S G minus S F and this value has to be calculated at 0.2 bar. So, the data will give you what is that your S g is equal to 7.9085 kilo joule per kg Kelvin. So, this will have for this you have to use saturated uh, table for pressure and S f we have 0. 832 kilo joule per kg Kelvin. Already we have S 3, S 3 can be found out from the state 3 data like from this conditions S 3 of 2804.2 kilo joule per kg S 3 and P 3 is 7 bar. So, this will imply S 3 is equal to 6.96 5 6 kilo joule per kg Kelvin. So, from this equations we have S 3, we have S f, S g, S f. So, this will give you x 4 s is S 3 minus S f divided by S g minus S f and uh, we arrive at this number as 0 0.866. So, at this point so, at the point 4, 4 s we calculate what is x 4 s 0 0.866. So, once we know this then we can find out h f h 4 s is equal to h f at point uh, state 4 plus x 4 s s g minus h f. So, the conditions that we have is that at P 4 is equal to 0 0.2 bar, if you take saturated uh, table pressure data. So, this will give you H f g is equal to 2358.3 kilo joule per kg. H f is equal to 
kilo joule per kg. Now, from this data we can arrive at what is H4S and that number it is 2293.7 kilo joule per kg. So, we have H4S then we can calculate isentropic work. So, W isentropic work is equal to H 3 minus H 4 S. This number is uh, already we have H 3 is 2804.2, H 4 S 2293.7. So, this is 510.5 kilo joule per kg. Then actual work. So, actual work stands as turbine work that is isentropic efficiency of the turbine into W isentropic. So, this number is if we multiply 0 0.8 into this number. So, we get turbine work is 408.5 kilo joule per kg. Then, but you have the power generated 100 megawatt at an turbine generator unit combined efficiency of 0 0.9. So, we can say how much power transmitted. which is I am writing just as W is equal to W T into 0 0.9. So, this number is actually 367.56 kilo joule per kg. So, this is the power we should be working on to calculate the rest number of the questions. So, we also know power which is developed is 100 megawatt and so we can now calculate what is the power which is we get for per cycle is 367.56 kilo joule per kg. So, we can say steam production how much steam is required is equal to 100 into 10 to the power 3 divided by how much power gets transmitted that is 376.56. So, steam requirement or mass flow rate of steam is 272 kg per second. What is volume flow rate? So, volume flow rate of the steam is equal to mass into specific volume. So, V 3. So, V 3 into m dot S T. So, V 3 is calculated based on uh, the state point 3 and uh, uh, that V3 is equal to V3 this number is we can get 4045 meter cube per kg. So, volume of the steam flow would be 1110 meter cube per second. So, volume flow rate is this mass flow rate is this. So, this is what we required what is the steam flow rate or we can say what is the volume flow rate of the steam. So, that we get from this part. Now, we will move on to this condenser part. So, condenser cooling water part we can write this equation plus cooling tower. We can use this equation that is through at uh, heat exchange process m dot 7 into h 5 minus h 7 is equal to m dot 4 into because this is this part and this is this part and heat is rejected from this condenser. So, m dot 4 into h 4 minus h 5. So, uh, we know that this cooling tower exit condition is 22 degree centigrade. So, condition 7 has to be found out from this data. So, at saturated temperature of 22 degree centigrade this will imply steam table data will imply H 7 is equal to 92.33 kilo joule per kg 
and we also know already H3 is 2804.2 kilojoule per kg. We also have WT is equal to H3 minus H4 turbine work is 408.4. So, this will give you what is the value of H4 is 2395.8 kilojoule per kg. So, we have H4, we have H7, then what is not known, what is H5? So, H5 can be calculated because that is at turbine pressure that is 0.2 bar that is nothing but HF, H5 is equal to HF to be calculated as 0.2 bar and that is 251.4 kilojoule per kg. So, from these equations all the numbers are known H5, H4, H7. So, this will give you cooling water requirement is 3667 kg per second and volume flow rate for the water would be 3.667 meter cube per second. Then next job is to find out heat added. So, heat added So, we started with 0.1, ended with 0.7. So, heat added which is Q in per unit mass is H1 minus H6. So, all these numbers are known H1 is 2804.2 minus 251.4. So, Q in is 2.5. 2.8 kilojoule per kg. Then we need to efficiency of the systems. So, efficiency of the system is W by Q in. So, W is already 367.54 that is the final work output divided by 255.2.8. So, efficiency of the plant becomes or system becomes 0 0.15 or approximately 15 percent or that is equal to 15 percent. So, efficiency is known and next uh, thing that is required is the heat rate. So, heat rate by definition we write H r is Q in into m dot steam into 3600 divided by efficiency into this power that is in kilowatt and uh, this is normally represented as kilojoule per kilowatt hour. So, through this conversion we define these things. So, we have already data what is Q in 2552.8 steam flow rate eight two seventy two kg it was kg per second. So, that is what we multiplied 3600 to bring it to kg per hour. Then efficiency is already calculated 0.15 into power is 100 megawatt. So, we have to make it kilowatt. So, 100 into 10 to the power 3. So, this is in kilojoule and this is in kilowatt hour. So, this unit now turns out to be kilojoule per kilowatt hour. So, we say HR heat rate is 156231 kilojoule per kilowatt hour. So, this is about the big problem which is for vapor dominated systems. Now, we will look into a small problems in which we have to see it is a liquid dominated systems. So, we the problem statement is for a liquid dominated geothermal systems 
So, we started with same uh, diagram temperature entropy diagram. So, we have liquid here, we have vapor here and uh, what is the question that is given is that we have an instrument which is called as cyclone separator or flash separator and that flash separator separates the brine that enters into the circuit and that separation happens at point 3. So, the question was asked that geothermal system the hot wired reservoir it contains water at 240 degree centigrade and 11 bar. So, your state 1 condition is nothing but your H 1 is your H f at 240 degree centigrade. Since it is already in a saturated liquid regions, so here we have to use this temperature as benchmark. So, at this temperature what is the enthalpy we can calculate from the saturated temperature table. So, that number is 1037.53 kilo joule per kg. Again process 1 to 2 is constant enthalpy process 1 to 2 to 3 So, which means H 3 is equal to H 1. So, H 1 data is already there, but H 3 data is not with us. So, H 3 is at a pressure. So, this pressure is at 240 degree centigrade and 11 bar and this pressure is 7 bar. So, H 3 is equal to H 1 that is nothing but H f plus x 3 into h f g and this pressure is at 7 bar. So, from this saturated table at 7 bar which will imply h f is equal to 697.22 kilo joule per kg and this h f is nothing but in this figure it is your H 5 and H G is equal to 2763.5 kilo joule per kg. Now, with respect to this figure this point is H 4 right. So, we have H 1 is already here. So, this equation will give you X 3 is equal to 1037.3 minus 697.22 and 2763.5 minus 697.22. So, ultimately we have x 3 is equal to 0 0.16. So, the question was asked that we need two parts one is what is the mass flow rate of water from the well and re-injected brine per unit mass flow rate of flow rate into the turbines. So, m dot turbine flow rate is 1 unit let us say 1 kg per second. Now, with these things we can say m dot w would be nothing but 1 by x 3 and this number is 1 by 0 0.16. So, that is 6.2. So, per kg per second. Per unit mass flow of the turbine the mass flow rate from the well would be 6.2 kg per second. Then mass of the brine that is re-injected is so that is 6.2 comes here 1 unit it goes to turbine and rest of the things comes here. So, that is m dot b will be 6.2 minus 1 unit so, this is 5.2 kg per second. Now, what is the enthalpy ratio? Enthalpy ratio of spent brine to the steam that is y is equal to spent brine is H 5 divided by H 4 into m dot b because that is the amount that was spent per unit mass flow rate of water into the turbine. 
So, H 5 and H 4 number is known that is 697.22 divided by H 4 is 2763.5 into 5.2. So, y is equal to 1.32. So, enthalpy ratio turns out to be 1.32. So, with this I conclude uh, this geothermal sections in this lecture. Thank you for your attention. Music